Hi, this is Dan Sullivan, and I'd like to welcome you to our next episode of Exponential Wisdom. I'm always thrilled because I get informed by my number one technology scout, explorer of all things technology, Peter Diamandis. And every quarter is new breakthroughs. Every quarter is new disruptions. One of them that I find interesting is suddenly certain words appear and they're being talked about, they're being written about. One of them is the problem of fakes, things being faked in the digital world, photographs, people's voices, people's interviews, all things Russian and Nigerian. I mean, <laughs> if it's possible to fake, they've probably tested the possibilities. And then the other thing of a, a new concept, which I hadn't heard it in these terms, which is NFT, which is non-fungible tokens. And there's also the whole prominence of cryptocurrency. So we got a lot of digital activity happening right now, as you predicted 10 years ago. It was deceptive, but a lot of things that were deceptive when we first collaborated on A360 are now becoming disruptive. They are. They are. And it's kind of crazy. Yeah. So if those of you who haven't heard about NFTs, it's the new buzzword. If you were going to look at the Google prominence, you'll see this spike. And just by definition, again, an NFT is a non-fungible token, and it's using the blockchain to give you ownership of something that could be easily duplicated. So, you know, if you've got a digital piece of art or anything digital, a digital piece of writing, you know, one of the things that makes digital so amazing, it's dematerialized and demonetized. And you can democratize it. You can send a thousand pieces of a beautiful piece of artwork to everybody. But the question is, how do you prove that you own the original one? I'll give you an example. Last week, Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, is offering to sell the world's first tweet as an NFT. And it's been put out for bid. So far, the highest bid is $2.5 million. And we're going to see this in terms of a wide range of things. Have you heard about any particular things being put on an NFT? I mean, there's artwork, there's music. All kinds of things. Well, I got interested because you brought it up at one of the early A360 meetings. You know, I would check Google on a continual basis. And one of the areas that's really interesting is that diamonds were one of the, I'm talking about mined diamonds here, not mm -hmm. manufactured diamonds. And they have a lot of issues with them. First of all, if you have diamonds, are they real diamonds? And who owned these diamonds before you're being sold the diamonds? A thing called provenance, which also applies to artwork. You know, then there's political issues about where the diamonds are being mined, how they're being mined. You know, are they using slave labor? Are they using child labor? So anyway, it was one of the first successful areas where there is a means by which diamonds can be encrypted digitally with their own identifying mark. And any reputable jeweler has the sensing equipment to actually tell you what the provenance is of a diamond. Okay, so that was one of the areas that I saw it right off the bat. And the challenge is, of course, things that are not easily replicated. But the other thing that you can do is you can use the blockchain for providing ownership to multiple people. Yeah. So if you've got a Van Gogh, for example, that you want to be able to liberate some capital from, you can say, I'm going to put this Van Gogh on the blockchain and I'm going to sell 20 people ownership in it mm -hmm. so that the blockchain allows you to, in fact, you know, demonstrate dear friends of mine own two Van Goghs, for example, that are probably real, but they're not a hundred percent, you know, demonstrated the providence, as you said, and they're going to be spending money to do the appropriate x-rays and assessments and so mm -hmm. forth. So I said, what you should really do is basically put this on the blockchain, allow, you know, a hundred people to buy one hundredth of it or a fiftieth of it, if you want to keep half and then take that money and invest it in demonstrating the providence of it. And then once you've done that, the value should increase a hundredfold, right? So yeah. a lot of interesting business models that will come out of that. Well, you know, the basis for all good economics and the basis for 
all good government in the physical world is property rights, you know, that Mm -hmm. you actually own your property, you know, and the English-speaking world, northern Germany and, you know, the British Isles were probably the ones who were most advanced where they gave individuals rights to their property. The property cannot be taken away by a higher authority, and that developed, and the U.S. has some of the strongest property laws in the world. But the big thing about this, Peter, is that capitalism is not understood because some people think it's like a political system. Capitalism isn't a political system. It's a method of dealing with people at a distance where you can trust strangers at a distance. F.A. Hayek, who is a Nobel Prize winning from Austria and then England and the United States, he said about capitalism, he says it's an ever-expanding system of increasing cooperation among strangers. Mm -hmm. And how do you deal with strangers in trust when you don't even meet them? And it's halfway around the world. And if you don't have trust, the whole economic system is weaker as distrust moves in. So my feeling is that the blockchain there's only half the world, uh, half, you know, half a billion people who want the blockchain because there's members of the other half of the world who are baking things. And <laughs> so there's kind of a virus, antivirus here going on. And my sense is, is just that greater trust in strangers is a necessary foundation for the expansion of the global economy. I mean, we talk about the technology that'll do this, but fundamentally the technology is not useful unless there's trust with who you're actually dealing, supply chains, international trade, everything. It all depends upon proof that what someone bought, they're actually getting. And as we begin to digitize everything so that it moves faster and faster, because the speed of capital, the velocity of commerce is exploding on the planet, The challenge is that digitized things can be replicated with very little cost. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do you keep yourself safe from that? Yeah, let's weave in and come back to NFTs and give some additional examples here in a little bit. I just want to say the word fungible, you know, that the most fungible store of value on the planet is probably the U.S. $20 bill. Mm. You know, that anywhere you are on the planet, if you have a... I'm I'm saying a twenty dollar bill because in Canada you can't pass an American hundred dollar bill, you know, because they're worried about forgeries and everything like that. But the U.S. twenty dollar bill, and that's why it's a reserve currency. The country that's considered the reserve currency or the currency is the one that's the most fungible. Hmm, interesting. I'll read a definition here just for fun. So non fungible more or less means it's unique one of a kind. And it can't be replaced with something else. So, for example, if you have a Bitcoin. It is fungible because you can trade one Bitcoin for another Bitcoin. But if you've got a one of a kind trading card, it is non fungible. You know, if you trade it for a different card, you've got now something completely different. So the question is, how do you have non fungible items, unique items, even though they're duplicatable, mm-hmm. but unique in terms of the original ownership of a piece of art, piece of music, something? So fascinating. Now, I do think that this is. In response to a couple of different factors, Dan, I think it is in response to digital fakery, and I want to come back to that in a microsecond. I also think it's a response to the fact that we're beginning to live more of a virtual world in that, you know, we're at the inflection point of what's called the spatial web. We've talked about this a little bit before, and the spatial web is where you are living in a virtual world, and the virtual world looks very real. There's a piece of artwork on the wall and the resolution of it is getting better and better from the next generation of Apple and HTC and Facebook Mm -hmm. glasses. Mm -hmm. And that piece of artwork on the wall may be the digital original that you can prove you have Mm -hmm. and you can move things between virtual worlds and you can move things between the virtual world and the real world. Well. Physical yeah. world, I mean. Oh, uh, the physical world, yes. I think yeah. the digital world's a real world. I just think it's not what we're used to. But I consider the digital world just as real as any other part of the world. Sure, I can see that. Did you see the deep fake video that was just circulating the web recently on Tom Cruise? Yeah, 
Can I tell you my response to it? Sure. If I hadn't seen the actual Tom Cruise photo, when I looked at the photo, I wouldn't have thought of Tom Cruise because I've got two people I've known in my lifetime who are very similar to the fake. I didn't think it was that great of a fake, actually. Okay. Well, a lot of people did. Mm -hmm. And there is a multitude of companies that are developing this kind of technology. You know, and I shared a couple of them at A360 this past year, Soul Machines, as well as Hour One that's out of Israel. And it's getting better and better as machine learning algorithms and computational power are massively increasing. If we're not there yet, we will be in the next year or two where it is indistinguishable from voice and imagery mm -hmm. to tell from a real person. And in fact, one of the interesting points made by the team at Hour One is their prediction was by 2025, almost all video on the web will be deep fake, will be generated video. Tampered with. Really. Not tampered, but generated video. In other words, if you have video content you would have put out, you may have the words and you will have a digital version of Dan generate the video automatically while you're hanging out with Babs having a glass of wine. In other words, if the system can generate someone who sounds identical and looks identical, the words are written you know, can you create mm -hmm. a video that is you and I right now, right? Can we have a Dan algorithm and a Peter algorithm having this conversation? Yeah. And we're going to get there. Well, then the, the issue is that what you're seeing is that what Peter approved and is that what Dan approved? Sure. Okay. And this is where the NFT comes across the line. You know, it was like in political campaigns, it's now possible to edit someone's words so it seems to people that they said, but it was just the opposite of what they were saying. So it brings up the need, how can we authenticate that the person actually said these words? So my sense is wherever there's deception, there's a response to that. There will be some point in the next two years where someone's defense is, that isn't me, that is a digital facsimile of me saying that and I was someplace else. I know it sounds like me, I know it looks like me, it yeah. isn't me. Well, everybody makes a living and there'll be just as many people making money exposing fakes as people making money creating fakes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, one requires the other in the world. So, you know, the whole issue of voter ID has come up for various reasons and various campaigns. And my feeling is that NFT, Here's what I predict, and I'm not making a political statement here in the sense of which party or not, but the party which historically has profited most from voter fraud will be totally against NFT as a validation for voting, <laughs> mm -hmm. whichever party that is. Yeah. <laughs> we can go into the realities of the inefficiencies and the ridiculous elements of the voting system with the how we have a representative democracy, not an actual democracy in the United States. No, it was never designed as a democracy. It was designed as a constitutional republic. The United States has never been a democracy. Yes, I agree with you there. But it is possible to have an actual democracy where one could have one person, one vote, and actually not by state, not by county, not by, you know. Yeah, yeah. but it would favor one party over another, absolutely. Yes. And it will never happen. Let's not go down the political rabbit hole. No, no, no. I'm just saying, you know, any more than you'll ever have democracy in China. <laughs> I hope we don't get canceled as a result of that. <laughs> Hopefully not. You know, when people say, Peter, what are you worried about in this exponential world, right? Because I'm not as worried as other people are about AI. The deep fake arena, though, is something that gives me pause and concern. It gives me pause and concern because right now, all of us, our de facto default is to trust what we're seeing. That when we are seeing someone speak on news or on a video or on a Zoom, that it is that person and we're hearing what that person actually feels and thinks. And if we get to a point where that isn't the case, where I need to figure out how do I validate this? And we're seeing this in fake news right now, where a lot of news is opinionated, not actual news. And it wasn't that way 
in the 40s and 50s, right? I mean, when Walter Cronkite spoke, you believed him. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're an aficionado of history. What's changed over the last 50, 60 years? Well, I think the fragmentation of the media has been the big thing. You know, when I grew up and when you were born, there were three major commercial networks, and then there was a public network that came in a little later. And then when cable was introduced as a technology, then all of a sudden there was a massive fragmentation of delivery. I mean, there are 63, what are considered 63 major cable news networks in the United States right now. Okay. Wow. And there's only so much advertising dollars to go away. And actually, I think the thing that changed the news most was Google and Facebook because they became the 800-pound gorilla in effective advertising. I mean, they're, whatever the else the two of them may be, they're the greatest advertising agencies in the history of the world. You know, New York Times, you know, I mean, all the most influential institutions in the news media, the classical news, they're dying for advertising dollars because they've just been, you know, like the two of them together have 70% of all the print advertising, you know, has changed over to Google. So I think the cable, the fragmentation, and then I think Google and Facebook really cause it. You know, it's very famous, the Harvey Weinstein, you know, case. The article that did him in, this was by Rowan Farrow, about, you know, sexual misconduct on the part of a major, major Hollywood. That had been written seven years before, and because his studio put so many dollars through the New York Times, they could keep the article from coming out. But then in that same time period, Miramax, the uh, film company, had to go to, to Google and Facebook, and they weren't putting the dollars through the publication, so they, they lost their protection. Huh. Everybody talks about Google and Facebook in terms of social media. That's not their big impact. Their big impact is advertising dollars. Sure. They just changed the entire economics of advertising. Yep. So, you know, I imagine that these deep fakes are going to play in advertising where I see you know, President Obama trying to sell me the latest shaving cream or somehow people, you know, got an image of my mom and there's a deep fake of my mom saying, Peter, mm -hmm. you need a new jacket, come over here and let me, you know, it's going to be fascinating. And the question is, will the technology exist? Is it going to be possible to differentiate between a highly accurate deep fake and not, right? Yeah, well, there's a funny thing from history, the word sincere, which was originally a Latin word, and it had to deal with fake silver statues in the marketplace in Rome. And they found out that hardened wax, you could make it so hard that it had the same weight as silver, so you could actually hollow out a silver statue and you could fill it with hard wax and then just cap it with silver. So if you weighed it, it weighed exactly what silver was, but it was mostly wax. And so sincerity means without wax. <laughs> so the silver merchants in the marketplace would say, sincerity, sincerity, you know, which meant that their statues didn't have wax in them. So we've got a lot of news that has a lot of wax in it, you know. <laughs> yep. So my sense is that humans adjust to new attempts to have things not as they're presented. You know, we have all sorts of electrical, you know, sensors and things that kind of indicate to someone, you know, fingerprint, eyeball will be the next one, you know. So my sense is that it's a virus, antivirus thing, you know. Where Agreed. I mean, there's no question. You well, know, here's like the thing that's individual. What would you do as an individual if this was a problem? I mean, you know everybody in the technology world. I bet in a short period of time, Peter Diamandis would work out of a way to make sure that what he was seeing was the right thing. I mean, I think you'd have inside expertise that would help you do that. Whether it was widespread and available to everybody else, in the final analysis, you know, the biggest cause of inequality in the world, Peter, is that you favor your kids over everybody else's kids. <laughs> you know, what I teach for my folks that I coach is that the world's biggest problems, the world's biggest business opportunities. Sure. And so yeah. as this raises to become a problem, there will be those folks, you know, it might well be that whenever I'm putting anything out, 
I've got a appropriate blockchain identifier that's transmitted with it that unless it's verified, I mean, this is the way if anybody's using like Coinbase to trade cryptocurrencies and such, there are multiple verification steps required to avoid this kind of duplication. And NFTs, you know, on the Ethereum blockchain and Ethereum adds a level of computation on top of just the blockchain. What's interesting about the NFTs, going back to that, Dan, is it's allowing people to sell stuff that was really not sellable before. Yeah. So if you've got a piece of digital artwork and before it was, you know, if you tried to sell it to somebody, their concern was, well, a million other people can have the same thing. So why? In our basement here in Toronto of our main house, we have a piece of original artwork from Walt Kelly, who is the cartoonist for Pogo. Okay. Babs, one of her aunts, her mother's sister, was a big Pogo fan. So she wrote a fan letter to Walt Kelly and he responded. So his fan letter is there. And then there's a frame piece. And it's just for one day's cartooning. It's in black and white and it's the original ink and the, the sort of blue lines that they use to sketch things out that aren't photographable so that they could do it. And he says, Rosemary, I just loved your fan letter and I just wanted you to have this. This is my piece of art that I did yesterday and I just wanted you to have that as your own. Well, that could be an NFT. Yes, you could put it as a and sell rights to it. What's his name who played Kirk in the original Star Trek? William the, Shatner. Not what's his name. Walter <laughs> Shatner had x-rays of his teeth converted to an NFT, and it was like an atrocious price, you know, that somebody paid for it. People were saying, well, that's absurd. And I said, what's absurd about it? And they said, well, that's not worth anything. I says, well, obviously it is. So it was like in your city, Mike Trout, baseball player at the Angels, signed the biggest contract two or three years ago. And it's like $30 million, more than $30 million a year for 13 years, guaranteed. And somebody said, that's absurd. No baseball player is worth $430 million. I said, well, somebody thinks somebody's worth it because they wrote the contract. They wrote the check. Things are worth what people are willing to pay for it. So I'll get a follow up on this. So here it is. Fans bought 125,000 non-fungible token trading cards featuring Star Trek William Shatner on the Wax blockchain. Yep. So and people they so that's absurd. And I says, well, all you're saying is that it wouldn't be worth anything to you and you wouldn't pay for it. That doesn't dictate what other people think it's worth. Yeah. So it's interesting, right? Because we're starting to begin to see the use of the blockchain in economies. And, you know, there were crypto kitties before, but, you know, we've been talking about, you know, Bitcoin has been the primary means. And in our next episode, let's talk about Bitcoin, about the velocity of capital. But man, oh man, we're finally seeing some interesting business models for the use of the blockchain. Mm -hmm. You know, the economy is extraordinarily flexible. And one of the things you're going to talk about is, you know, your use of a particular new investment vehicle over the last couple of years, where before it might have been very, very hard. You didn't need an IPO. You needed something else and you needed more than you could raise privately. And so a new vehicle was created. And we'll talk about the that. SPAC. The we'll SPAC. talk about SPAC. <laughs> it's middle of SPAC mania. You're Dr. SPAC. Anyway, we'll talk about that because... Ingenuity relates to all parts of human life, and financing is a very fruitful area for new, ingenious ways to get financing for things. And more capital means more innovation, more experiments, and it's a virtuous cycle. So I'm going to track NFTs. Yeah. I have to see if I have anything I want to put on the Ethereum blockchain as an NFT. And these deep fakes, you know where I think deep fakes are going to play a huge role is going to be the next election cycle. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to start to see a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and the challenge is when you're in this kind of an insanity and you're just throwing stuff out on the web or on TV and it gets in people's minds, they don't stop. Mm -hmm. If they're in their own echo chamber, they don't stop to ask, is it valid or real or not? It just reinforces them. So I think we're going to see a new level of sort of digital nuclear war in the next election cycle with deep fakes playing a much more prominent role.
Well, that's my prediction. Well, it'd be interesting, you know. <laughs> interesting, at least. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next episode, let's talk about the velocity of capital and I'd the love fact to. that we're hitting more available cash from investors into startups than ever before. Mm -hmm. All right, Dan. Talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you, Peter. Bye.